we have a number of young people that have grown up in the church that are either teenagers or young adults. And sometimes we take for granted what they do know. And we have new people that come along and we take for granted what they may know about the doctrines of the church and sometimes we're wrong because we don't know what it is. I remember some years ago when I was in Kansas City, I gave a Bible study and I just made a, an offhand comment, something about the church being taken over by the state of California. And I was shocked when I looked up there, I saw these faces that seem to not know much about it. And I said, well, how many of you don't know that the state of California tried to take over the church and virtually every hand went up? They didn't know it, even though it was something that those of us who were older took for granted because we heard a lot about it during that time. And then we figured everybody knew everything about it and we just kind of stopped talking about it. And so there are subjects that we need to cover from time to time, very basic subjects, and the one I want to cover today is a subject that I see even among some of the older people getting a little bit off track on, maybe forgetting what the foundation of it all is, and that is the mark of the beast. So the title of the sermon is, What is the Mark of the Beast? And as we know, there have been many speculations over the years, and every new technology brings a new speculation. Uh, for example, there was a time, it's hard for us to imagine today, but there was a time, apparently, when the Social Security card or a Social Security number was speculated as the mark of the beast because it had to do with buying and selling, had to do with getting a job. My card, showing how far back I go, has at the very bottom of it says this not for identification purposes. Well, that's gone by the wayside a long time ago, and I think they've taken that off newer cards. But it is used for identification for all kinds of things, jobs and uh, you know, maybe credit cards, different things you want to get that you have to give your Social Security number. Now, Canada had something or has something actually called a social insurance number, the acronym of which is SIN. Now, that surely must be the mark of the beast because it is sin. Barcodes came out, and everybody jumped on that, that this must be the mark of the beast because it was on everything from the back of a stop sign to anything you bought in the grocery store or any place else. More recently, the quick response code, that little square thing with all the little black dots and everything that's in it that you don't know exactly what it's saying. But some have jumped on that. Then, of course, there are those who think that the number 666 will be tattooed on people's foreheads or on the back of their hands. A lot of confusion about what it is. And, of course, how many have jumped on the bandwagon of a computer chip theory, that they're going to insert a computer chip in your hand, maybe between the thumb and the, the first finger there, or on the back of the hand, or right in the middle of your forehead someplace. There have been plenty of those who think that's the mark of the beast. And what all these have in common in reality is they do have something to do with buying and selling. I don't know about the 666 on your forehead, but uh, the other things, a quick response code, and they have something to do with buying and selling. But are they the mark of the beast? And we need to recognize that there's a difference between the means of enforcing or recognizing it and the actual mark itself. Those who have been around the church for decades probably have a bit of a different idea as to what the mark is, and of course that's what we, we haven't changed our doctrine on that one iota. Yet some have latched on this computer chip idea because it seems so plausible that they can control things that way. We have a lot of younger people, as I mentioned, that are growing up in the church, and five or ten years can make a huge difference. We have those who maybe are 12 years of age, as an example, I'm sure we have at least one 12-year-old here, and by the time they reach the age of 16 or 17, there's a lot of difference in the thinking and the ability to reason out. I know that God began calling me when I was, I think, barely 16. I could have been 15. I, I always said 16, but thinking back on it, I might have still been 15 going on 16. 
And the first book that I ever read was the book of Revelation Unveiled at Last. And that got my attention. My parents were not in the church, but I realized, looking back, that a 16-year-old can understand an awful lot. You don't necessarily have to have God's Spirit dwelling in you, but it can be working with you to be able to understand things. And a 16, 17, 18-year-old can certainly understand these things, and maybe even 14 and 15-year-olds, because I've known a few that were 14 when God began to call them. And so if you're a young person here today, and I know we have a lot of them that are missing because of weddings, because of uh, a vacation and, and that sort of thing, but There will be others that hear this later on going out. I hope that you will listen and listen to this puzzle that God reveals to us because you can know what the mark of the beast is. And that is, as I said, the subject of our discussion today. I'm going to begin in Revelation, the 13th chapter, where it actually introduces this subject. Revelation, the 13th chapter. And we'll be shifting back and forth a great deal between Revelation and elsewhere. But we're going to begin in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation. And I'm only going to read for now the critical verses here in terms of this mark. This is where everybody begins speculating as a result of what is said here. In verse 16, it says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their, fri- on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So this is where people get this idea about a mark of the beast. It has to do with buying and selling. There's something associated with it, the number 666, as they see here, and it affects whether you can buy or sell. So this is very critical as to uh, what it means here, and people then jump off into the wild blue yonder speculating what this mark might be. But I'd like to start with something that is very fundamental, something that is almost universally neglected. And that is that the mark of the beast is the mark of the beast. If it's not of the beast, it's not the beast mark. And that's something that, as I said, is almost universally neglected because people that jump onto social security numbers, social insurance number, barcodes, computer chips, all of that is not starting with the most fundamental point, and that is that it must be of the beast. And if it's not of the beast, it's not the beast's mark. We'll begin our study here in finding out then who the beast is, because without understanding who the beast is, we can't understand where the mark comes from. So we'll begin back in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. And I know these passages are very familiar to us, and sometimes we cover these things in various contexts, but I'd like to cover in the context that really we we need to look at it from. And I'm not going to read every verse in these chapters, but here in Daniel, the second chapter, we know that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he had a very vivid dream. And it was in technicolor, apparently, because he saw gold and silver and bronze and a dull-looking Uh, iron and clay. So he saw it uh, apparently in splendid color, and it was not the typical dream. I'm sure that Nebuchadnezzar didn't look for the wise men every time he had a dream. I don't know about you, but I have a lot of dreams these days. There was a time in life where somehow you, you sleep so soundly you just don't remember your dreams. And then you get a little bit older, and at least for me, I remember them a little bit more, and they're as we know, kind of crazy dreams. But this was something that was, was unusual. And, and obviously, Nebuchadnezzar recognized that there's something special about this dream. Now, he was no doubt superstitious in various ways, but he called all the wise men together. And 
there was perhaps a, a reason to purge some of them, and he could use that excuse, but he said, you've got to tell me what the, the dream was before you give me the interpretation. Otherwise, you can give me any kind of interpretation, and how do I know if that's the right interpretation? And he actually started to slay the wise men. And Daniel was informed of this, and he came before the king, and he said, I can't give you the definition or the interpretation, but there is a God in heaven who can. And so he began here in verse 31, he says, you, O king, this is Daniel giving, uh, telling what the dream was, first of all. He says, you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, this great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So the legs, two legs on this, this uh, image here, obviously, uh, most of us don't have three or four, uh, there are two legs here, and yet when you get down to the feet, there's a difference. So you have really five different materials being used here, the gold, the silver, the bronze, the, the iron, but now you have a mixture of iron clay at the very bottom of this image. He says then, verse 35, the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and let me go back, uh, verse 34, it says, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, in other words, supernaturally, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. So that is where the image is destroyed, on the feet there. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was, was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So then in verse 36, Daniel says, this is the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar obviously knew that that was the dream. Can you imagine what it would be like if you had a dream and you ask somebody to interpret, to interpret it and to even tell you what it was and here's somebody that comes along and tells you what the dream is? I would think that the interpretation would be very significant for you at that point in time because this is not something that would just happen by chance. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. Verse 37. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Then verse 39 says, But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. So it is important to recognize that, and I say this because people come up with all kinds of ideas that, well, it, these, these four kingdoms are all in existence at the same time at the end and everything. But he says, after, uh, after this, you shall, uh, shall arise another kingdom. After your kingdom, another kingdom, but it will be inferior to your, yours. Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall, be, uh, shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like the like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. It absorbed all the others. It destroyed the Greco-Macedonian Empire, which had been consumed by, uh, which had consumed the Medo-Persian Empire, which had consumed the Babylonian Empire. And this fourth empire consumes them all, destroys them all in that sense. Whereas you saw the feet and the toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. So the legs are of iron, but when you get to the feet, it says that this image is weak in certain ways. It's fragile. It still has great strength in the feet, but it also is fragile or brittle. And you saw the iron, verse 43, mixed with ceramic clay. They will mingle with the seed of men. That's another clue here, that they're going to be mingling with the seed of men or different countries, different ethnicities, different people of, of different uh, locations that uh, don't always get along very well. And it says, but they will not, they will not adhere to one another, they don't naturally adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. But in the days, verse 44, these king, kings, 
The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And you can read the remainder of the chapter, but very clearly it's talking about the kingdom of God being set up on this earth. The Messiah coming, the second coming of Christ. And so this, this image that he sees there begins with Nebuchadnezzar, and it goes all the way down to the coming of Christ. And so it affects those of us who are here today. Because this dream has a part of it that is going to take place, not just now, but in our future. We'll turn over to the seventh chapter of Daniel. God gives a progressive revelation about these four kingdoms in the seventh chapter. And here in verse 1, we find that it is still during the time of Babylon. It's the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. So it is still at the beginning of this first kingdom. And it says, Daniel had a dream in this case, and visions of his head while he was on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. So again, Daniel must have recognized that this is really an unusual dream. This is not something that, that normally happens as we go to bed at night. And so Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision my, by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, or the Mediterranean. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till the wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Now, I don't have time to go into all of the details of this, but the Babylonian Empire, uh, there were some comparisons with eagles, and we find here that a man's heart was given to it. We can read the fourth chapter of Daniel, how Nebuchadnezzar had to be humbled, and after seven years, then he came back with a, a man's heart, as it were. And, and so we see that, and it says, and suddenly another a second beast, like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three uh, ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. Verse 6, another, or after this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. And the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So we have... The first one with a head, the second one with a head, and now we come to this third beast, and it has four heads. And it's not a forehead, but four heads. Uh, and so we find that that's six heads. And then verse 7, after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, reminding us of the legs of the image. It was, devout, in other words, made of iron. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with his feet. It was different from the be all the other beasts before it, before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up amongst them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Now, when we look at this whole chapter, we, we see that we begin here now to have a description that goes forward in time of the coronation of the king of kings at the very end. He says in verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. And it describes this, this uh, being there. Verse 10, a fiery storm issued and came forth before him. A thousand thousand ministered to him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. So that's introducing something here. And then verses 11 and 12 gets back to what Daniel was doing here. He says, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beast, they had their dominions for a time, but it was taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. Now it gets back to this, this uh, 
picture that he has in heaven. He says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. This is really talking about the coronation. Christ had qualified during this lifetime, and yet God did not remove Satan, but there's coming a time when he will be removed, and Christ will receive for himself a kingdom and return. You could compare Luke, the 19th chapter, where it talks about him going to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then to return. Verse 15, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me, and I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. And he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Now, it isn't it interesting that God interprets his own symbols. He gives all these symbolic things, whether it be an image of a man with a head of gold and feet of iron and clay, or whether it be of these four beasts, he gives those, those uh, images, and then he explains them. And yet so often people read about the images and then just run off into the sunset with their own ideas. It says, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Now, in other words, three great kings, or in verse 23, a fourth kingdom, so king or kingdom used synonymously here. And so these are four great kingdoms which arise out of the earth. Now, we know what the end point is, which is the coming of the Messiah or Christ, the second coming. And so we can work back and we begin to see that we're talking about the very same kings or kingdoms that are given in Daniel, the second chapter. It's also interesting, if you hold your place here and just go over the next page uh, to chapter 8, we have another vision here that takes place during the, uh, the reign of Babylon. And this is the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. A vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel. And it is of a, a ram and a he-goat. And it gives that description of what happens, how the, the he-goat comes along with one horn and just uh, tramples all over the ram. And then we find out the, the interpretation of it down in verses 18. It says, understand the last part of verse 17, actually. Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end, a time in the future. Verse 19, in the latter time. The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media, Media and Persia, and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. And so then he describes how that kingdom of Greece is going to have a large horn, it's going to be broken off and four rise up. We find that it's talking about the same thing. This is the same image or the same, uh, same understanding as the second and the third beast. And the third beast being the uh, kingdom of Greece, and how the, the first horn, Alexander, uh, you know, just rode across the, the sky or the, the land like he wasn't even touching the ground. Uh, we, we all learned that in school. I say we all learned that in school. I don't know. That's not true probably anymore. But uh, it, the, the story goes that he conquered the world so, so rapidly that he cried because there was nothing else for him to conquer. At least, I mean, there was still a lot of earth, but... That was the old story that probably is, is a myth, but anyway, and nevertheless, he did it in a very quick fashion. And so when we look at these four beasts that we read of here in Daniel 7, they're the same as the kingdoms of Daniel 2, and the second and third kingdoms are found there in the eighth chapter of Daniel. And we could even go to the eleventh chapter and we can read of the intrigue that goes on there, but it's talking about an outline of history, that there would be four kingdoms beginning with Babylon. Now, that's not saying that there weren't other kingdoms elsewhere. You have China, for example, and you have the Aztecs and others in South America and Central America. But we're talking about from a biblical perspective that touched Israel and uh, that it's going to influence the earth in a big way. He speaks of these four kingdoms. 
Verse 17 of chapter 17, those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. So that very clearly shows that that fourth kingdom is going to last until the very end. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. So he says, I watched, and the same horn was making war against the saints. This little horn was making war against the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So it's very clearly this continues all the way to the very end. Now there's more to the story there, and you can read it, but very clearly it shows the, the court being seated in verse 26, and the kingdom and the greatness of the kingdom is given to the saints of the Most High, there in verse 26 and 27. Now let's move forward in Scripture because God is revealing more as we go through. And the book of Revelation puts a lot of things together, a lot of ideas, a lot of images, a lot of prophecy that he puts it in a certain order for us to understand. And so we come to the 13th chapter of Revelation, and it says in verse 1, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, this is John, I, I, I was reading Mr. O'Gwen's booklet on the Beast of Revelation, and he said something that he was standing on the seashore on the sand, and I thought, oh, I don't know about Patmos. Was there a lot of sand there? And it's right out of the scriptures. Some of those little details that sometimes we miss. I don't know that that has any significance, but it's just a detail. And he says, I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Now right there we have an interesting thing because we can look back at Daniel the seventh chapter and we find the lion, the bear, the the, uh, the leopard. And so what is the, the significance of this? Well, when those visions were given there in the book of Daniel, it was during the first head, the, the first empire, Babylon, all of them. And yet John is writing in the late, what we think is 90s AD, and Babylon had been absorbed by Medo-Persia and the Greco-Macedonian Empire, Alexander the Great, and then his four uh, generals after that absorbed Medo and Persia. And then the Roman Empire absorbed them all. And the only beast that is alive at that time is the fourth beast. And so John doesn't, see, doesn't go back to the previous ones. He just sees a composite of all of them, a composite beast that has the territory and the the characteristics of the lion, the bear, and, and the leopard. And then it says in verse 3, it says, I saw one of his heads as if it were, had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. Now of the heads of this, this beast that he's seeing here with seven heads and ten horns, uh, re recall that there were seven heads on those four beasts that we read of in Daniel, the seventh chapter. And so they're all combined together, the, the heads as well as the characteristics of those beasts. And so one of the heads here has a deadly wound. Well, all the others were gone. And so the implication here is that the head was the final one. Uh, the final beast, the Roman Empire. And it says the deadly wound was healed. 
Well, this wasn't the deadly wound of Medo-Persia or Babylon or whatever. This was the deadly wound of the Roman Empire that was, was uh, uh, wounded, a deadly wound, but it was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? Now, a few years ago, there were people who came out with speculations that this must be the United States. The United States is the beast. I don't know how many have heard that, but I, I certainly have. And the reason that, in part, that they give that, I'm, I'm sure there, in fact, I know there are other reasons why they say the United States is the beast. But part of it is that who's able to make war with him? When you go back to the, the first and second Gulf Wars, you realize that the United States is a very powerful force in the world, whether it be conventionally or uh, nuclear, the United States is, is preeminent in the world. Uh, even the, the Chinese, which have uh, increased significantly in their military, really don't want to take on the United States, nor does Russia, nor does anybody else. And so based on that alone, people jump to the conclusion that, oh, the United States must be the beast. And yet when we look at the history of the beast, it's all over in the Middle East and the Mediterranean area. And we find that there's a, a, uh, a little horn that is described there with pompous words, and it goes all the way to the very end. In other words, we, we need to look at the big picture and not jump to some ridiculous conclusion. I'm sure that people would not think that's a ridiculous conclusion, but you don't base it on the fact that the United States is able to make war. You, you could go back a few years and you could look at the British Empire and who was able to make war against them. Well, God gave this country, as we'll celebrate here in a few days, the ability to make war with the British Empire. But when you really look at the history, uh, we were pretty... It was touch and go, and it took about eight years to settle that issue. And they had to go all the way across the ocean. We were on our own territory. But Britain was a powerful force that someone might say, well, who's able to make war with them at that time? And there have been others down through history that if you'd look at it from a very short period of time, uh, you could say that with Germany during the early stages of World War II. But verse 5 says, He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. So this deadly wound comes on this head, but he is given the authority to continue for 42 months. Now, 42 months, if you multiply by what we know of as a prophetic year, which is 30 days in a year, in a month, in a prophetic sense, when we compare a number of scriptures, comes to 1260 days. And we all are familiar with the day for a year principle, the 14th chapter of, of the book of Numbers in verse 34, and also Ezekiel, the fourth chapter, verse 6, show us that sometimes, especially in a prophetic sense, a day can equal a year. And so the deadly wound is healed and it will either be healed for 1,260 days, three and a half years, or 1,260 years. And so we have to look at the context, and we have to look at history to know the answer to it. When we look at history, we find that the Roman Empire had a deadly wound in 476 A.D. That's you know, the, the date that, they, uh, that historians have agreed upon. Nations don't always die in just a single day, but that was really the end of it, 476 A.D. And it continued for a number of years without a Roman uh, uh, power there. Uh, you can read John O'Gwyn's booklet on the Beast of Revelation to find out what happened with the three horns of the three that uh, are plucked up. Back in Daniel 7, you can read that, and I, I encourage everyone to read that, and especially if you've never read it, if you're a young person or someone who's new, 
if you read that booklet and study it, and you read these four chapters primarily, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Revelation 13, and Revelation 17, and become slightly familiar with them, you can understand these things. But he continues for 42 months. Now we know that in 554, Justinian revived the Roman Empire once again. And that was with the behest of the, the Pope, the blessing of the Pope, the uh, so-called Christian Church at that time. But that began in 554. And after him, you have Charlemagne and Otto and Charles the, the Great, I guess it is, if I've got this right, and then Napoleon. And we're more familiar with Napoleon because it was more recent when Napoleon fell in 1814. He did come back for a little bit after that, but was met as Waterloo, and uh, that was the end of it, but essentially was destroyed in 1814. So when you take 1814 and you subtract 554, when Justinian revived the, the Roman Empire, it was called the Holy Roman Empire down through that time because the church, uh, controlled it in many respects. And a number of kings found just how powerful the church or the pope was at that time. And there's a lot of history about that. But the bottom line is that during that time, there were five restorations or five revivals uh, during that time from 18, I'm sorry, from 554 to 1814, 1260 years just as it speaks of here, that it would continue for 42 months, or 1,260 years. Now we get back to the story in Revelation 13 and verse 6. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Now, when it speaks of every tribe, tongue, and nation, or let me rephrase that, when it speaks of many water, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get back to that. But over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And what we find here is that he makes war with the saints. When we look at who was it that persecuted the saints down through history, was it not the Roman Empire in one form or another? All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And then in verse 11, it says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. So here's a two-horned lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. He looks like Christ. Christ is the Lamb of God. He looks like Christ, but he speaks like the dragon. In other words, it's a counterfeit. It's, it's something that is, uh, a, a, what do they say, sheep in, in, a wolf in sheep's clothing, you might say. He exercises all the authority of the first beast, of this beast that we read of earlier in this chapter. And he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So this is obviously someone who has great miraculous powers. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Now, if we look at this from a historical perspective, we see that during the time of the Holy Roman Empire, the time from 554 to 1814, when the Catholic Church had great power, they had lots of signs, lots of, quote, miracles, you know, bleeding hands, bleeding this, whatever it is. They still today uh, come up with some of these things. And, and they used signs to deceive the people. And they also persecute the church, the true church. And they turn them over to the state, and the state then would uh, then, then torture or kill them. We've heard of the Inquisition or the Spanish Inquisition, at least 
When I grew up, we heard of that, the Spanish Inquisition. There's a, uh, the book, uh, I haven't read Don Quixote, but, uh, uh, but I, I saw the play, uh, Man of La Mancha, uh, during time of the Spanish Inquisition. And it, it is interesting that that was a time, a terrible time for the saints of God. That here was a church calling itself Christian, persecuting those who did not agree with them, those who kept the law of God, who did not keep the day that they observed and all the other doctrines that they had, those who did not baptize their children and so forth. They were persecuting the true church, the, uh, uh, the, this false church, this two-horned beast is describing there. And they made an image to the beast, to the first beast. So it, they patterned their government after the first beast. And if you look at how they did it, they, they elected their leaders. And today, the Catholic Church, as an example, has patterned itself after the Roman emperors. And although they were dictators in a sense, they were, they were elected by the Senate. And so you have a very similar situation there. He was granted, verse 15, power to give breath to the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great. And this is where we get the statement about the mark of the beast. So what we're seeing here is this beast as it travels down through history, and we'll go to the 17th chapter now, it will move into the future a little bit further. What we find in the 17th chapter is the beast after the deadly wound is healed. Notice that this beast is ridden by a woman. And the ancient one, up to 476, was not controlled by the woman. There was certainly interaction between the woman and the empire. But it was only after 554 that the woman rode the beast. And so this beast that we read of here is one that is ridden by the woman. And so we get more details of what's happening here. Verse 1, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Now, the waters, if you look at verse 15, it says, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So it, it actually describes or, again, explains its own symbols. Now, this woman is, commits fornication uh, with the inhabitants of the earth, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication, so he carried me, verse 3, away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So now we see this beast, and this woman is riding the beast. The woman didn't ride those previous beasts. She is riding this beast. And as we shall see here, this is the one from 554 onward. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. We note the, the very vestments of the, the woman. If you go on the internet, you can find that and ask, what do the Catholic priests wear? And you find that purple and scarlet are used over and over and over again in the description. She's adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations, such as the mass, as they call it. And the filthiness of her fornication on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of abominations of the earth. And so she is a great mother church. She is a mother who has given birth to harlot daughters. You know, it's really hard to read this and not understand what it's talking about. I uh, mentioned this in Winnipeg recently, and it was very, I thought, very explicit and one of the questions that came up is, well, who is the great whore and who are the harlot daughters? They just choo, right over their head. I guess maybe they needed to have it spelled out. 
But it says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So this woman, this church, has brought about the, the death of the saints of God. She didn't do it herself, but she turned them over to the state to do the dirty work. But the angel said to me, verse 7, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now this tells us something about the timing of the understanding of this. Because he is talking about a beast that was, but is not. And yet it is. Now you have to think, when in history was that? Well, certainly after 1814. From 1814 till now, it had to take place sometimes there because everybody thought that the end of the Roman Empire came, the Holy Roman Empire, but they, that it came to an end in 1814. It's interesting that Mr. Herbert Armstrong was raised up, God used him, to begin to explain these prophecies back in the early part of the last century, or the middle part of the last century. That's when he came to understand these things. During a time when the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. He says, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Rome sits on seven hills, hills, mountains. In fact, when we were traveling there some years ago, our guide was telling us about all the pagan churches that have become Christian churches. And there's hill number two, and there's hill number three, and there's hill number five over here, recognizing the seven hills of Rome. Very famous. Look it up on the internet. You'll find it there. The seven uh, heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, but... These mountains have a greater representation as brought out in the next verse. It says, there are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. So the five who had fallen very clearly were during that 1260-year period. They were beginning with Justinian and ending with Napoleon. In our booklet on the Beast of Revelation, Myth, Metaphor, or Soon Coming Reality, which I hope all of you will take time to read, uh, shows exactly which ones came up at different times, and it goes into much greater detail. And so he says, five have fallen. One is, again, this is a clue as to when it is that this would begin to be understood because it's writing up from a perspective of five already, be, uh, already in the past, and now there's one, but there's one yet to come. And, and so with Hitler and Mussolini, we have the one that is, actually began a little bit earlier before that, but we have the one that is, and the other has not yet come. It is yet in the, the future. And when you look at this, we ought to be very confident in knowing what the future is, that there will be another resurrection. Now until the war in Ukraine, Germany was very pacifistic, still is to many, you know, to, to much respect. But there's beginning, beginning to be a transformation. In fact, a transformation took place within hours or days of the invasion. And so 100 billion euros being dedicated to rebuilding the military, as well as more than 2% of GDP. And there are things that are happening, even as we speak, that we don't fully comprehend the, the effects of it. Last week, we woke up to realize that this uh, Wagner group had, uh, was marching on Moscow. And then by the time services were out, well, it was all over. But the fallout from that has yet to be seen. And we don't know exactly how this is going to play out over there. But what we do know is there's a war in Europe, 
And any war in Europe is going to make all the other nations nervous. And we're in for some real surprises here. We know the outline of history, but we don't know exactly how we're going to get there. And so, as I've said before, and I'll say again, expect some surprises, some things to happen that we would not have anticipated, like the war against Ukraine. That kind of came out of nowhere. Not that it couldn't be seen by those who were really looking at the facts, but it seemed to come out of nowhere, just like COVID seemed to come out of nowhere. Yes, there was some talk of something over there in China, but everything's going along, and then all of a sudden it hits in a big way in the world. There's some other surprises that are going to take place here. But it says seven kings are pictured by these seven mountains. He says there are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, now that one that is is, is past, but there's one more to come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. You can read that in Mr. O'Gwin's booklet where he makes an explanation of that. The ten horns which he saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So these ten horns on this beast are not talking about succession of empires. They're talking about ten kings at the very end that are going to give their power over to this beast power, this seventh uh, restoration or revival of the empire under uh, the, 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 uh, with a woman writing it. It says, these are of one mind, verse 13, they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them. So now we see that this comes right up to the very end and you have these 10 kings. And then you refer back to Daniel, the second chapter, where Christ is going to smash the image on its feet of iron and clay. And so what do we see today? We see that in Europe, they can't quite get it all together, can they? Because the French and the German are different. The, the Czechs and the Poles, are, you know, they're different peoples. They're, they're of different backgrounds. And they can't quite get it all together. They've been struggling to do so since the early 50s with the coal and steel uh, union that they had there, the, the six uh, countries, uh, the Benelux countries and Germany and France and Italy, I believe it was. Uh, and they've been expanding, but they can't quite bring it together. And something is going to cause them to come together, and it will be, no doubt, a very interesting group of nations that come together, some of which could be antagonistic and enemies right now today, but they could suddenly make strange bedfellows for a greater purpose. They're going to make war with the Lamb eventually. We know that there are other things that are going to happen. We read elsewhere in the book of Revelation how there's going to be a war between east and west and so forth and north and south. We read there in, in the book of Daniel. There are going to be a number of wars that take place there, a number of skirmishes, and some of them pretty serious. But nevertheless, at some point in the future, they're going to fight against Christ at his return. And then it says, the ten horns, verse 16, which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. There's always been an antagonism between the secular power and the spiritual power. I say spiritual or religious. For God has put it in their minds to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast uh, until the words of God are fulfilled. And then in verse 18, the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. It's a city which is both secular and religious, the two horns. Uh, it is a city-state. It reigns over the kings of the earth. If you go to Vatican City today, you will see the flags of all the embassies of nations from around the world that have embassies there at the Vatican. So, we've gone through all of this for one purpose, and that is to identify who the beast is. 
because without knowing who the beast is, we cannot know what the mark of the beast is. That's an essential point. We know that Satan is a master counterfeiter. He copies what God does with a bit of a twist. We can read over in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. we have very familiar with this. 2 Corinthians 11, I'll just read verses 13 through 15. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. We sometimes talk about Christianity and sometimes people think, well, at least, they're, at least they believe in the Bible. God doesn't speak very nicely of them. He calls them harlot daughters. He calls them a great whore. Now, the individuals we know are deceived, and we were part of that, many of us, so we, we're not throwing stones, we're just looking at the facts. He says, for such are false apostles, these ministers, deceitful workers transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. He's not going to appear like the devil. He's going to appear like an angel of light. He's going to appear like a lamb. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. And we know that those who take the mark of the beast are going to have the wrath of God come upon them, as it says in the 14th chapter, and we'll get to that in a moment. He's a great counterfeiter. And let's notice, if we were to find the mark of the beast, we ought to find out how God refers to a mark or a sign in Scripture, because it is the Bible that is going to interpret its own symbols. In the 31st chapter of Exodus, we read in verse 13, says, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Eternal who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. That's what God thought of them at that time. Uh, in the nation of Israel, they'd be put to death if they profaned the Sabbath. And we read of one incident where a young man uh, was put to death for that reason. Now, you can read the remainder of, the, uh, of that chapter. But what about the hand and the forehead? What about what it says there in Revelation 13 about something being stamped on the hand and the forehead? Again, we could run off into the sunset and look for some sort of a, a clue as we look at current events. And if we do that, then we'll make the same mistake that those did who thought that the Social Security number was the mark of the beast or that the sin card was the mark of the beast, or even credit cards, some people thought that they were the mark of the beast, because without them you can't buy or sell. Well, we, we know we still can, but they were looking for, okay, this is what it must be. Or we could look for chips in the back of a hand. You know, we don't, we don't need chips in the back of the hand to be able to identify us. There was a lady and her daughter that was going to, what was it, the Metropolitan... Not Art Museum, but uh, uh, Rockefeller Center or someplace here within the last year. And she was barred from going in. Why? Well, because she was a lawyer and worked for a law firm that was suing the corporation there. And they recognized her through facial identification. I don't know, we realize it's already being used, facial identification. Or if you want to get a, uh, a go through a, a card where you can go through the airport faster, an eye scan. When I was in England, they always fingerprinted you every time you came back in. 
So there are all kinds of means. They don't have to put a chip in your hand. All they have to do with artificial intelligence, they can read your face. That's happening in China, in parts of China. And there's a lot of talk about that as a possibility. So the means by which this is going to be, we are going to be recognized uh, and they'll know what we're doing or whatever, it's out there. It's been out there and uh, we, we don't need to speculate on that. What we need to find out is not the means of enforcement, but we need to look for the mark itself. What is the mark? What is it that's going to trigger a problem with this world? And specifically, that's going to rise up in Europe. Well, if we go to Exodus, the 13th chapter, we can see that God interprets his own symbols. And it is God that is going to tell us exactly what this, this sign is. And, and God has a sign of his people, as we've already seen there in Exodus 31. But now we look at Exodus 13, and speaking of unleavened bread in verse 7, we are to eat it seven days, and no leavening shall be seen amongst you in all your quarters. And then notice verse 9, it shall be as a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes, that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. You see, this is how God defines a, uh, a sign on our hand or between our eyes or in the forehead. This is a symbol that he's used very early on. And so we, we should let God determine what it means. Now, did God want us to stamp unleavened bread or the Sabbath or anything else, literally put it on our forehead or on the back of our hands? We know that the Jews did some of those things. They had little, little uh, boxes with the, the commandments on them and a little leather strap, or they put it on the back of their hand. But is that what God is talking about here? Well, the forehead is signifies the intellect, decision-making, what we're going to do. The hand symbolizes work. And so we read here, it is a sign to you on your hand and a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth for the strong hand the Lord brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then we notice verse 16 again. It's talking about the, the firstborn and so forth. And it says, it shall be as a sign on your hand and as frontless between your eyes. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. And then we could go to Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. This is the Bible's definition of what is written on the forehead or on the hands. It has to do with God's laws here. And so in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter... Verse 6, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Now, what commandments? Well, we have the, the fifth chapter where we have the Ten Commandments restated once again. And so he says, these words which I command you today, these Ten Commandments shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. Verse 8. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. So God is saying here that his commandments, his Sabbaths, his holy days, this is what is to be in our forehead and in our hand. And does he mean literally where you strap, strap them on in some sort of a physical way? Maybe I shouldn't say literally, but physically or is this a symbol of something? Remember, Satan is a great counterfeiter. And in Daniel, the seventh chapter, Daniel 7 once again, and verse 25, it says, this is of that little horn, that stout horn, that works with the beast. He says, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times, and law. Who is it that said, we have a better day than the one that God gave? See, God, God was, was really good, and he, he got nine of ten correct. Well, actually, for Catholics, only eight of ten, because 
idolatry as well. Who was it that changed the law? Who was it that said that we can have different days? Not just the Sabbath, but Christmas Day. Throwing out the holy days of God and substituting them with days that come out of rank paganism. The mark is a sign of disobedience. We know that from various scriptures that God's wrath is going to come upon those who are disobedient. Colossians 3 verses 5 and 6. Because of these things, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, idolatry, etc. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. That's who the wrath of God is coming upon. In Romans, the first chapter, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. That's Romans 1, verse 8. I'm sorry, verse 18. And then in Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11, it speaks of this third angel that followed them, saying with a loud voice, and so this is going to be a witness at the very end for mankind, If anyone worships a beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he shall receive, and he shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So it goes on to say, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Who worships him and so forth. So this mark of the beast is a sign of disobedience and that is who the wrath of God is going to come upon. God has a sign for his people. Satan comes along as a great counterfeiter and he has a sign. In this case it's it's a mark, it's something that's stamped and forced on people. God allows us to make the decision whether we're going to keep the Sabbath or not. But Satan comes along and says, I have a a different day and I can enforce it. You can read in Mr. O'Gwen's booklet on how Constantine changed the day. In 321, he called it the venerable day of the sun. And I'd like to just take a moment to read a little bit out of this booklet. I don't have much time, but I want to read a little bit because what we find is that sun worship, which is where we get the worship of God on Sunday, the reason it's called that, was endemic in these great empires of the past. This is on page 29. He says, the mark of the beast is a brand of disobedience to God. Not only must this involve rejection of God's sign of obedience, the Sabbath, but also the acceptance of a counterfeit sign or mark. This mark is, in reality, a brand deriving from Babylon and Rome. Is there such a symbol that has come all the way down to modern times? It says, in ancient Babylon, the king served as high priest of the sun going all the way back to Babylon, Bel Marduk. Quote, to take the hand of Bel Marduk, in a quote, was part of the ceremony of installation as king in Assyria and Babylon. That's from Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition. The celebration of the winter solstice around December 25th was regarded as the birthday of the sun. It was a major holiday associated with gift giving and the sacred evergreen tree. Not only did much of Babylonian pagan worship involve the sun, but so also did the worship of each of Babylon's successors in its own turn. First in Persia and later in both the Hellenistic or Greek world and Rome. In fact, by the time each of Daniel's four beasts arose, sun worship had risen to prominence as the imperial religion of each of these empires. Persia and Babylon's first successor, uh, I'm sorry, Persia was Babylon's first successor. Ancient Persian religion centered on the worship of Mithras, the god of light. As a result of Babylonian influence, however, Mithras came to be identified with the Babylonian sun god. 
And of course, that's where we get December 25th, the birthday of the sun god or Mithra. The Greeks in Asia Minor identified Mithras with their ancient sun god, Helios, and contributed to the westward spread of the cult of the sun. Alexander the Great traveled to Egypt to the temple of Amun-Ra, where it was the center of sun worship, to be proclaimed by the priest as the literal sun, S-O-N, of the sun, S-U-N, God. And what of Rome? Mithras, identified with Sol Invictus at Rome, thus became the giver of authority and victory to the imperial house. Lamprier's classical dictionary states that Sol, the sun god of Rome, was worshipped as the Baal or Bel of the Chaldeans or Babylonians. Sun worship and its symbols were adopted by the Roman Empire from her predecessors and passed on to the entire Western world. There's much more we could read on this very subject, but think about it. When you see art, what do you see? You see this halo, various, sometimes this way or sometimes this way, symbol of the sun. The art, everything in Roman history and going back before that goes back to the worship of the sun. God has his day, the Sabbath. We don't call it Saturn, although we sometimes say Saturn, Saturn, Saturday, but God has a seventh day. Satan came along with his counterfeit, a day involving the sun, the worship of the sun. And everything else about the worship of that organization has to do with the worship of the sun. The mark of the beast is not new. Revelation 20 verse 4 says that those who don't take the mark, they're going to, they're going to rule with Christ for a thousand years. This isn't something that just happens at the very end. Is something that's been going on a long time. The mark of the beast is a counterfeit of God's sign of his people. This sign is not new. It's been enforced to varying degrees down through history, but it will be enforced with a vengeance in the near future. I think we can see how in our technological age what people believe can be, believe can be tracked as never before. Some of you are out there on the internet. You've blabbed all over the internet. Okay, sorry, but it's true. And they not only know you and what you believe, but they know everybody else here because one way or another, what you believe is known out there. I don't care if you have a computer or not. Somebody's probably mentioned your name. And we're all linked together one way or another. There are databases that have that. But that's not the mark of the beast. What we believe, though, is uh, a rejection of the mark of the beast. There are eye scans, there's facial recognition, who knows what other technologies may come along. But we must realize the difference between the mark and the mechanism used to enforce the mark. Everyone will be forced to choose one side or the other. When I give Tomorrow's World presentations, at least in the last few years, I very often, but not always, come to Revelation, the 17th chapter, and come to verse 5, where it says that the whore is, is the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I always tell the people, I say, I'm going to give you a question that is probably the most important question that you could hear today. I usually introduce that a little bit before I get there. And then finally come there and say, okay, here's the question. If you understand who the great whore is, which is pretty explicit, then who are the harlot daughters? Now, what I don't usually say, and I think I'm going to start saying it, is that depending on how you answer that question, depending on where you go to church, is going to determine whether you've already taken the mark of the beast and continue to do so. Because everyone is going to have to make a choice. Even those that are not religious will, in effect, take a choice to be subdued by the, the beast power and their rules of how to conduct themselves. You know, we have young people sometimes that grow up in the church 
and they fall in love with somebody outside the church, and they get married. And then sometimes what happens, because the people they marry outside the church aren't just always louses or jerks, if it's a guy uh, or a girl, either one, they're not necessarily evil people in the sense of, of being totally evil, but they have their religion. And when kids come along, where does it usually go? And there are young people who have grown up in the church of God who are accepting the mark of the beast. And that's why I say it's important for young people to understand this, because you're going to be forced to make a choice one way or the other. You're being forced to make a choice. Every one of us. This is not a child's game. What happened back in Daniel, the 11th chapter, is not a child's bedtime story, nor all the rest of the scriptures we've read today. They're talking about history from the time of Babylon all the way to the return of Jesus Christ. And when we put the whole picture together, it shows that we have to make decisions. So I hope that we all continue to make the right decision. But the mark of the beast is going to be enforced more severely in the future. It kind of goes up and down. There are times when it's enforced severely and times that it's not. But the mark of the beast is here, but the enforcement of it is coming.